Um, I forgot that she was my daddy. Oh, wait, that was like, it is. Yeah. 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 Okay, we've got 1.30. Why don't we get started? Good afternoon, Research Methods. Welcome to Wednesday of, of week nine, kind of a rainy day. Thank you for making it through the rain. We've got some good news. We've got a wonderful presentation coming up, a colloquium, tomorrow at 4.30 over in Burton Morgan, all the way downstairs in the Burton Morgan Lecture Hall. Dr. Rebecca Ackman will be talking to us about her research on video games and how these have been shown to improve skills in perception and in attention. And I think it's really neat that we have somebody who's actually done the research here uh, giving this, this talk for us. I hope that you'll make time in your schedule if you can. I realize some people might have commitments. It's clearly not a requirement, but we hope that you'll come out and uh, enjoy the talk. I think you'll find she's really a, quite a captivating speaker and it's a very interesting topic. So we hope to see you tomorrow at 4.30. Right. Any questions about that? Okay, one more time, we get to celebrate the really good news, and that is that we've got the section exam coming up. So let's all here for the section exam. Yay! <laughs> all right, we can't wait for that. And we've done this before, the section exam we've done before. Also, we've talked about this, okay, uh, that we're going to try to keep it all in perspective. Some people get anxious with their tests, but we just want to remind you that this entire course is only 1 32nd of your GPA, and the upcoming exam is only a very small fraction of that 1 32nd. It's only worth 100 points. We've done all of this before, so very much like what you've done in previous exams. Uh, the emphasis is going to be more conceptual than computational. Right? We, we're going to have you do, if any computations at all, and there might be a few, uh, there'll be really quick ones inside of Excel. You'll not need to open SPSS uh, this time around. And you might get to be quite familiar with the in function, the dist function. You might want to review what we did the other day with confidence intervals and so forth. Uh, Z-scores, um, effect size, uh, the, there was a formula that we had for Cohen's D and so forth. So please make sure that you know standard deviations and uh, standard errors, the things that we've been talking about here, but no extended com uh, computation. It'll be very limited uh, computations and you won't need to open SPSS at all. All right, any questions on that? Okay, wow. Wow, that went really quickly. Okay, let's put that one away. It sounds like you're well prepared for that. And, Sorry, I, I, sure. Um, you said review all PowerPoints, so does that mean the stuff from last test? Yes, yes, the nature of our work is indeed cumulative. Uh, but you do have limited time, so I would say please emphasize the material since 9.30, September 30th. That's the first day that we came back after we had our first section exam. So the emphasis will be from 9.30 on to 10.22, uh, but the nature of this class is cumulative. It is a quantitative reasoning class. Okay? Yeah, please. Will the layout of the exam be like the last one? Approximately. The question was, will the layout of the exam be like the last one? It'll be short answer kinds of things. Right, yeah. So like not multiple choice. Right, not multiple choice. Yeah, and, and thank you for the question, uh, why not multiple choice? There are some dentists and professors that will occasionally use multiple choice exams. I think multiple choice exams can do certain things well. At Denison, one of the things that characterizes your, your education is that the faculty here really push the students for what we call generative responses. That is, we want you to be able to generate sentences and sort of justify why it is that you're coming to your conclusion. And that's harder to do on multiple choice tests. Uh, multiple choice tests are very easily graded, and some faculty members across the nation like it for that reason. Uh, and you actually can test critical thinking by uh, an appropriately worded multiple choice exam. But we really want to see how people are generating their responses, uh, because much of life is not so multiple choice. So we think that's better preparation. Okay. All right. We're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to go back to something that we touched on. Uh, we've already t dealt with the 1015 PowerPoint. Uh, you don't have to open it right now if you don't want to. Uh, but when we touched on the 1015 PowerPoint last time around, we were coming up on a computer quiz at the time. And this 1015 PowerPoint dealt with t-tests, and we did, actually didn't have t-tests on, uh, on the last quiz. We'll, we'll roll it into maybe the next computer quiz. But I also wanted to give it its due. There are some conceptual issues that are very likely going to come up on Friday's test. And we've already had some conversation about this. You've already watched the video on this. But we, we shortchanged it a little bit last time, I think appropriately so, so that we could prepare you well for the last 
quiz that we had just before you went on fall break. So I thought it might be appropriate to go into some of the issues that we had on the video, and then toward the end of today's session, I think it might be best to reserve a few questions for anything that you might have as a, uh, a burning uh, desire to know, particularly with respect to the 930 to 1022 PowerPoints. Okay. All right. All right, so why don't we do this? Why don't we see if we can start rolling on this one sample t-test idea? First, who remembers hearing about the one sample t-test? Okay, so we, we talked about it very briefly, and it was also in the video that you watched way back when. So this is in the range of videos and PowerPoint presentations uh, that will be tested on, on Friday. So I thought it might be uh, a good opportunity to go ahead and, and look at that. So as you might remember, and I think it was Jenna who may have had the question for us, we had taken a look once before at this. During that day that we reviewed this, I asked if there were any questions, and Jenna brought us to uh, this particular slide. I thought it might be fun for us to actually do a one-sample t-test uh, and make a measurement. We made a measurement yesterday, uh, and we, we wanted to understand something about confidence intervals yesterday. Now we'll see if we can make a measurement to understand something about M&Ms, and we'll do this uh, using a one-sample t-test. So this is something you might remember from the video from a little while back. We have the multicolored M&Ms over there. And this is allegedly the proportions that these things are manufactured in. Now, uh, you might imagine that they probably can't really guarantee exactly 16% in any one packet. But if we were to take a sample of M&Ms, and I just came, got back a couple of hours ago from the Granville market where I picked these things up, uh, you would think that maybe if we averaged across the entire class, we could ask the question, gee, do we really corroborate that number, or are we going to disconfirm that number? So we'll look at green M&Ms, uh, and we'll, we'll ask whether or not we can match their claim, uh, almost like a Mythbusters here. We'll, we'll see if uh, they're really true to their word that they've got 16% green M&Ms. Okay? So first question, um, it, it occurred to me, I was really looking for the regular M&Ms, but they just happen to have these, so I, I picked those up. Some people actually prefer peanuts. There might be somebody in the room with a peanut allergy. Anybody here with a peanut allergy? Okay, uh, I don't think that would preclude the rest of us from opening the packets, but if somebody didn't want to be handling it, one of my best friend's daughters has a very severe peanut allergy, and uh, I think she'd be okay touching these things, but she might not be. So I just thought I'd, I'd check that out before we wind up with an EpiPen situation <laughs> in here, okay? So we're all okay with this? Okay, why don't you break them open? Please don't eat them yet. Um, Put them anywhere you like on the desk or uh, on your papers or wherever, wherever it is. We're going to try to count them. And what we want everybody to do is try to figure out what proportion of green M&Ms you have in your packet. So we'll give you a couple of moments for this. And if you need to open up Excel just to do the, you know, I have four out of 23 or however that, those numbers work, okay? You can use Excel as your calculator. Try not to spill them. <laughs> they do roll a little bit. Don't eat them yet. No, no eating yet. We're going to count them up. And then what we'll do is we'll go around the room and we'll ask you to report your proportion. And we'll get a uh, mean on these. We'll get a standard deviation. We'll actually do a one sample t-test. We might be able to see a 95% confidence interval. Uh, all kinds of things to be done here. While you're doing that, I'm going to create a variable in Excel called um, number, now we'll call it percent, green mm. <laughs> Feel free to pop open Excel if you need to uh, run the computation and count how many you have overall and then how many you have of green specifically. Yeah, we'll, we'll do, yeah, you can group them by color if you want, but we're really interested in green. If, if we had a little extra time uh, and you wanted to make notes of what other colors you had, why don't we do that? You know, if you can, if you can maybe compute all possible percentages, we'll do the test on the green, uh, but we have several different colors here. No, no, you don't have to, you don't have to count. Uh, so all you have to do now is just count your proportion. You're going you're gonna to send me, you're going to... Um, Give me one number, the proportion of green M&Ms. If you also wanted to make a note of the reds or the other colors, that's cool. <clears throat> but we're really just testing green here. 
see if these folks are true to their word. To be fair to the Mars company that produces this, I think they only make this claim about the regular M&Ms. I don't know if these proportions hold for the peanuts also. Dr. Weiss, who has the class before us, uh, does this every year, and he claims he's never been able to falsify what they've said. It is a falsifiable claim, but they've always been true, that they've always found um, that their numbers are within statistical error of the 16% claim. But he uses regular M&Ms, so now we're trying peanut M&Ms. Still hear numbers going in, so we'll give you a moment to do that. <clears throat> How many people have their green M&M proportion? Okay, some of us do, most of us don't. So we'll, we'll go for another moment or two. I'm just looking around the room and I, I see Pretty good variability. Some people have a big stack of oranges. Yeah. yeah. You don't have any red. No, oh, somebody went over red, okay. All right, that would increase the size of the error bar, right, if we were doing this with red. What did they say about red? It's, I'm going to flip that back up. <laughs> red was supposed to be lowish, that was 13%, okay. So we're looking at sweet 16, that's going to be our number. How many people now have it? They have their proportion, their percentage? Okay. Anybody? Need, I think we're good to go. Is it, yeah, okay. All right, why don't we see what we've got? I wonder if I can start with more. Are you, are you set more? Are you still? Okay, so um, you can just give me a percentage. 23% green, okay. And then we'll go to Nina. 17%, 21%, 14%, 14, 14, 5, 5 9, 9, oh, um, 7. 7 for green, right? Yeah. Okay. 7. 7. Mira, is that? Um, 14. 14. Meg? 16. 16. Wow, Meg's right on the targeted value. 10%. 10 13. 13. Kip? 1.35, okay. I'll buy it. 19. 19. Natalie. 17. 17. I'm not oh, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> right. All right, so we'll wait for just one more uh, number to come on in. Okay, so, uh, and I'm curious, can people start floating, why don't you yell out your number of uh, M&Ms overall? I'm wondering. Wow, these numbers are not all the same, so I wonder, uh, maybe they go by weight? I don't know how they figured this out, right? You'd, you'd think that they're, they probably sell it by weight. The outside of the box probably says how many ounces? Uh, 3.4 ounces, okay. So maybe there's some variability in size, and then they, they sell it to you by weight. Are we okay? 12.5, thank you, Brittany. All right, so we have all of this, and we're going to run a one-sample t-test. You will not have to run one in SPSS now, but anybody want to remind us how we get this analysis going? Now, what would I click on if I wanted to do a one-sample t-test to test the hypothesis that in the population, the mean percentage of green M&Ms is 16. That's the null hypothesis that we're testing here with a one-sample t-test. Right, we have just this one sample of M&Ms. Okay. How do I get the analysis going? Want to yell it out? Analyze. I was trying to give you a clue there. <laughs> okay. Okay, and what we're going to do here is that whenever we're dealing with t-tests, we're dealing with means. Okay, so what we're, in this particular case, we'll do a compare means, okay, and one sample t-test, right? Okay, 
And what we're going to say is we want to look at this variable, and our test value was 16%. Right? People understand where that number had come from back on this PowerPoint slide. We had gone out to the Mars Corporation website, and we got these numbers. So they're, uh, they're alleging that they've got 16%, and we're going to see if we can um, corroborate that or disconfirm that. Okay, here we go. Ah, okay, and we're, we're out over here, so I'll see if uh, people are able to see that. Can you read that in the back row? Okay, all right, really good. So n equals 16. Uh-oh, our mean was 12. We came in a little bit low, right? Okay, we have a standard deviation um, given there. And percent of green M&Ms gives us a T value of minus 2.09. So here's our T's, right? And the null hypothesis is saying that there is no difference between our observed value and the test value that we have. We're making a comparison between those. We're looking at the difference between a mean and a test value here. And if we, if we had exactly 16, then that would be our mean, and we would subtract from that uh, 16, and we'd be right at zero. And then we can ask, are we somewhere near there, or do we find an extreme difference that we have here? Okay. So I'll let you take a look at this, and we'll let you vote with one, two, or three fingers. Please put up one finger if you would like to reject the null hypothesis, two fingers if you would like to retain the null hypothesis, and three fingers if you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay? So based on the information that's up here, we're evaluating that null hypothesis. One is reject. Two is retain. Three is I don't know what's cooking here. Okay, I think I see most people putting up twos. Sasha, do you want to share with us how you got, came to a two? Okay, you use a significant value of 0 0.054. Two is to retain, yep. That's exactly right. Boy, it looks like we came really close. We got down to 0.05, but it's actually 0.054, <laughs> okay? So if that number had been less than 0.05, we reject. Remember that mantra, right? If the sig value is less than 0.05, we reject, okay? So in this particular case, the sig value is not less than 0.05, although it came pretty close, but it didn't quite get there. So that might mean that we have a negative t value, as you can see over there, and that's because we came in at 12, the test value was 16. If we did 12 minus 16, we'd wind up with this negative value. We're going to be down here. We came close to that boundary, but we didn't go all the way. Right? Who's following that logic? Anybody confused by that? Okay. All right, I wonder if we might go just one step further okay, and see if we can um, add something a little bit new here. I'm going to take away the T statistic for a moment. And I'm going to draw us a graph that we haven't seen before. This might help us to understand confidence intervals, which is what we did just the other day. Okay, so I'll ask you to draw this with me. We're going to make a little bit of an unusual graph here. It looks more like that. It's got this horizontal axis somewhere in the middle, cutting this right in half. And on our y-axis, we're going to have a different score. That's our difference score. And whenever we're doing a t-test, we're really looking at a difference between maybe two means or maybe one mean and a standard value, which is what we've got going on here. And what we can say is that we have values that might range, I'll make these up from a positive 5 to a negative 5, with 0 being right in the middle. Okay? So as we see our test value was 16, because that's what we got from the Mars website, what we observed was 12, we actually have a difference in here uh, it might be shown somewhere, our mean difference was minus 3.1. So we actually have now a negative value as our difference. Okay? I'm going to pretend that's about minus 3.13. And that's our point estimate for the actual difference versus the predicted difference. We can think of this line as being the prediction that comes from HO. HO was saying that in the population, the mean percentage of green M&Ms uh, would be equal to 16%. Right? And if it were the case that we took the difference between this and this, and they were both 16, the difference would be zero. So the null hypothesis is calling for a zero difference. Who's following that? Okay, did I lose anybody there? Or we're looking at the difference score? Okay, so Rachel, we're looking at a difference score, and we're calling for 16%. If we actually had observed 16, then it would be 16 minus 16, 
and that would give us a difference of zero. Does that work for us? Okay, so the null hypothesis said, well, either you're going to be at zero, or you're going to be so close to zero, you might as well call it zero. Okay? All right, so the actual difference wasn't zero, it was minus three. So we're down here. That's our actual difference. The null hypothesis was calling for that. Getting back to the question that uh, Jenna had asked a little while back, a few sessions ago, we can also put a 95% confidence interval on this. So this is actually what we empirically observe. Okay, this is our mean difference. And we could say that we have a lower bound and we have an upper bound. The lower bound goes down to something like minus 6. Okay, so it's down here somewhere. The upper bound goes past 0, but not very far past 0. Kind of like this. That's the 95% confidence interval. Yeah. Again, the upper bound hits 0.06, and that's a positive 0.06. The lower bound is hitting minus 6 and some change. Who's following that? Okay. So now we have the actual point, and then we have plus or minus that step that we talked about yesterday. So we have a particular sample here, and that sample is actually different from zero, but not by very much. In fact, we're 95% confident that the actual mean would have to fall somewhere between here and here. The actual difference score would have to fall somewhere between that upper bound and that lower bound. If we had a 99% confidence interval, it'd be up higher here and down lower there. But we do have a 95% confidence interval. Who's okay with that so far? All we did was put a confidence interval, just like yesterday. An interesting thing about this confidence interval, that I hope is intuitive to you, is that the zero point actually falls within the confidence interval. Right? So we're 95% confident that the zero difference, which is predicted by our null hypothesis, actually is in that range. Right? So we should be retaining the null hypothesis uh, for that reason as well. So this is just another way of saying the same thing, that if this guy is greater than 0.05, and it just barely is, then zero is going to fall somewhere in this 95% confidence range. Who's okay with that? Okay, all right. So hopefully that clears up a question that we were getting to a little while back, but we hadn't at that moment learned about confidence intervals. We learned those yesterday, so today was a good chance to put it into context with the M&Ms. Any other questions about the one sample t-test? Or, or how you might use a confidence interval in this case? Okay, you are free to eat the M&Ms. <laughs> All right, thank you for being patient. <laughs> okay, really good. All right. <clears throat> While you're chomping away, <clears throat> I wonder if we might do this. Um, I wonder if we might talk about something that comes up a little bit later on the 1015 PowerPoint. After we get through the one sample t-test, we build our way all the way up to two samples, and these are going to be independent samples. So we might have one group of people, another group of people who are being measured, and we might ask, is there a difference between means? So these are parametric tests, and you'll see that in a parametric test we have a whole series of assumptions that we've talked about once before, and we'll revisit them again today. Okay, so here's our independent samples t-test, and here's a long formula that we might get to calculate someday. We won't calculate this one today. I'm going to talk a lot about this on the video. And what I think I might do is have you open up in SPSS our Nessie file, and we'll do one example of an independent samples t-test. And we'll use this as an opportunity to learn about something that'll be important for Friday's test. And that is one of the assumptions, which is, well, maybe you can tell me. Um, is there somebody here who can re remind uh, us all about some of the assumptions that underlie the Pearson statistic and also underlie the t-test, the independent samples t? We have three different assumptions. Okay, Natalie's got something. Okay, right, so one idea, we might call this the Gaussian uh, assumption, right? And these are all, by the way, in the PowerPoint. Uh, they've been in a couple of these PowerPoints. And that's simply a bell-shaped assumption, right? So that uh, if we were to have a list of scores, we'd have a lot piling up in the center, and then some would be lower than that, some would be higher than that. We'd have something that was Gaussian or bell-shaped, the normal curve. That's our, our first assumption. Do you have others for us? Okay. Okay, we'll call that the equal variance assumption, right? So um, this is one bell-shaped curve. Maybe one of our samples comes from that. And then this is another bell-shaped curve, which has about the same variance. But it could be the case that one of them has a variance kind of like this, and one of them has a variance kind of like that, right? So we want to make sure that we have roughly equal variances. I'll draw that here. Okay. So <clears throat> if one of the 
two has a distribution like that, and the other has a distribution like that. Those might not be exactly the same, but those are pretty close to being the same width. On the other hand, if we had something like this, where one group's scores are kind of like this, and the other groups are kind of like this, okay, those are wildly different. Okay, those are very, very different. And we wouldn't have an equal variance assumption satisfied here, but we would over here. Who's following that? Is that working for us? Okay, so, so the first thing is it has to be bell-shaped, and then the bell shapes have to be at least roughly the same width. And there's going to be a test that we learned about today called the Levine test that gives us some indication about whether we can safely say that we have equal variances or not. And this will be a little bit like hypothesis testing itself. We could say that in a typical null hypothesis, we might say that we have something like the equality of means. The test value uh, that we observe will be equal to 16. Those two means will be equal. We can also say that we can have an equality of variances test, that the two variances will be equal. And then we can see, should we retain or reject the notion that we have equal variances? Just like we've been doing, do we have equal means? Okay? Now we're just doing that for equal variances. Who's following that? And then our third assumption, just to finish it off, it won't actually play a really big role for us, but just to be complete. Okay, right. So this is the independent assumption. So we have uh, the normalcy assumption, we have the equal variance assumption, and we have the independence assumption. Those are those are the three for any parametric test, right? And this is all, by the way, uh, in on the uh, <coughs> Here they are. I guess it's slide number 26 on the 1015 PowerPoint presentation. And it's going to be on some other PowerPoint presentation as well uh, when we went back and talked about um, the Pearson statistic. It's in there somewhere. <coughs> okay. Any questions on that? What the three assumptions are? So we're going to do a little bit of work here. We'll do an independent samples t-test. I wonder if you can open up SPSS and can you get to the Nessie file? Give you <coughs> a moment to get there. <coughs> How many people have that? Got the Nessie up? Okay. Really good. Okay, what we're going to do, let's go to variable view just for a moment. We'll drop all the way down in variable view. We'll go to the last variable. And you might notice that we have a scale variable. Can somebody tell us what goes on in variable number 93? What is it conceptually? It's called duration. Duration of what? Can somebody tell us? Time. Duration is a time. Uh, time for what? Time for M&Ms? <laughs> okay, how much time did you spend filling out the survey? And by the way, for those of you who are going on in psychology, that's actually a very interesting question because it could be that somebody comes into your study from Psych 100, they came to you through Sona, and you've got a survey that you're really excited about and you want to know how they're going to respond. And some students from Intro to Psych might not be that interested in your survey. So they come in and they just sort of run through it very quickly without really even reading the questions. Okay? And then they, they're done. They, they get their one credit or two credits for SONA and away they go. So it might be interesting for you to know how much time are people typically spending on your, your survey. In this case, it's the, the Nessie survey. Right. And what we can do is, since that's a scale variable, we can actually take advantage of that and we can do a t-test because if we're doing a t-test, we're computing a mean and that would require some kind of scale variable. Okay. So we can do a t-test on that and we can ask a simple question like, are there gender differences in the duration of time that we've spent fill it, filling this out? Just out of, out of curiosity, how many people think that there might be a gender difference in the amount of time spent filling out the survey? Anybody think that's, that's likely to be the case? Okay, so Mira and Kip think that might be a gender. Do you have a, a directional prediction, either of you? You think one gender in particular is going to spend more time? Okay, and that's what Kip would say also? Okay, so one idea might be that we could make a directional prediction that women will spend more time than men filling this thing out. It might also be that we can make a non-directional prediction, uh, which is to say that the two genders would spend um, equal amounts of time. And if there is a difference, we're not specifying which way it, it goes. Okay. All right, so why don't we see if we can run this kind of a test where our independent variable, the variable whose effect we seek to know will be sex, and then we'll use duration as our dependent variable. Okay? Anybody want to help me out on how to get this analysis going for this uh, two-sample t-test, an independent group's t-test? Analyze, okay. And because it's a t-test, we'll be comparing means, okay? 
And so when people are filling this out and they give us gender information, they're either going to be male or female. Those are the two options that we give them, male or female. And uh, I'll let you um, stay there. I'm going to click away from that just for a moment, just to remind us how this variable is coded. Uh, it looks like males are one, females are two. One way to remember that is male is one syllable, female is two syllables. Okay? So we know which code corresponds to which gender. Okay, so that was analyze, compare means, and we'll do independent samples t-test. I'll let you click on that. How many people are able to get that far? Okay. Independent samples, because a person is either male or female on the survey, not both. Okay. So our grouping variable, if we were to draw this out, we might think of this as being maybe the female population or the male population. Right. Our grouping variable is going to be pretty far down on the bottom. It looks like it was variable number 86. Okay. I'm going to stretch that out. You might go all the way down like this and click up just a little bit. See if we can find gender. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Ah, student reported sex. I'll click that there so hopefully people can see. And if I go all the way down, you can have the relative position there. And this will be not our test variable, but this will be our grouping variable. Grouping variable would be very intuitive, I hope. It's group one versus group two. Okay, so it's going to be male versus female in this particular case, so we can slide that one in. How many people have that as a grouping variable? And can we define that? We'll make group one here a one and group two a two. Anybody want to know, or maybe you can say why they have that group one, group two? Why do they prompt us for those? Any notions about that? Okay, thanks. Okay, we have to separate the data. You could have imagined that we could have had a different variable that had many more than two levels. For example, it could have been that we did something like, what state are you from? And then there would have been 50 states, and so we might say we want to compare comp uh, California to Rhode Island or something like that. <laughs> okay, and then we'd have to take, you know, state number 43 would be group one, and state number 16 would be group two. Okay, but right now we only have the two, so that's pretty easy. Okay, and then our test variable is going to be the very bottom variable, length of time spent on web survey, and we'll slide that one over. So that test variable turns out to be our dependent variable. The grouping variable is our independent variable, the variable whose effect we seek to know. Who's got that? Okay. All right. So we'll let this one go. Please go ahead. Am I still letting me, like, slide it over? Yeah, my You can't slide it over? You can't? <laughs> okay. You have to define groups first. Okay. Make sure. Uh, I think it won't let you go until your groups are defined. Yeah, the groups are defined, but it won't let me put length and time spent survey over. It won't. Okay. Is somebody else getting that, too? And you've got a, um, have you already clicked OK on your grouping variable? Okay, it looks like you're frozen. Sorry about that. I'll have to come around. Uh, somebody else got stuck too? Yeah, mine's good now. Oh, yours is good? Okay. So, no, not sure why, what's happened over there. Okay. If you can hang on just for a moment, we'll see what we get here. Can we all click on OK? And we'll get some kind of a output here. Okay. All right, and now I'm going to step us through something new. Now, remember that we said that if we're going to run this t-test, we have to satisfy certain kinds of assumptions. And what we're learning about today is this uh, assumption that we spent just a little bit of time on already, this equal variance assumption. So we're going to jot down that this is actually a two-step process. You can think of this as a two-stepper. And if you want to write down two-stepper, that's okay. Whenever we're doing an independent sample t-test, we have to do thing one and thing two. Okay. The idea is we evaluate... the equal variance assumption. And whenever we're evaluating an assumption or evaluating a hypothesis, we'll always use our SIG rule, okay? Um, and we'll put the SIG rule over here. If SIG less than 0.05, what do we do if SIG's less than 0.05? Typically? We reject. You've already gotten to be pretty good at that when we're testing the null hypothesis that the means are equal, for example. Okay? We've already gotten to be good at that. Here we're going to apply the same kind of a rule, but we'll take one preliminary step. We'll ask, is this assumption valid or is it not an assumption? That's, that's valid. And then we'll also evaluate HO. This is the one that you know already. And then we can say over here, if sig less than 0.05, same thing, reject. So that's always our rule. 
if sig less than 0 0.05, we'll reject. This time around, we just have to check in on one of our assumptions before we proceed. Please go ahead. Okay, this is the evaluation of an equal variance assumption. Okay, this is an evaluation of HO, are the two means equal? So it could be that this and this have equal variance, and it could be that they don't have equal variance. Okay, this is really just a matter of how fat they are. Okay, if you'll allow me, Gip, on this axis, this particular distribution has a lower mean than this one does. So the question about means is where are these positions left right? The question about variances is, how fat are they? Okay, if, you, if you allow me to grab that, if you can imagine, I can grab that, I can slide this over here, I can slide this over here, I could redraw it in here. Now this blue guy and that black one on the left have exactly the same mean, but they have wildly different variances. Okay? Yes, uh, but it won't be the same sig, so let's now check in over here. Okay, so hang on, let's see if we can do that. So now we've got this information. Let's take a look at the males. The males, were there 117 of them, they had a mean time of 14 minutes with a standard deviation, standard error. Then the females had 14.44. See, the people were correct that women actually did spend more time, but that might not be statistically significantly more time. Okay, so who's okay with that so far as our description? Is that working? Okay. Now we'll drop down and we'll take a look specifically at the independent samples t-test. And fortunately for us, they now introduce the Levine test for the equality of variances. They start out with step number one. Remember, evaluate the equal variance assumption. And over here, if you want to write on top of that, Levine. Levine's test is what we use for that. Okay. And here's Levine's test for equal variance. And here's our sig value. Okay. So I'll let you do the same thing that we did a moment ago. If you think we should reject the equal variance assumption, please put up one finger. If you think we should retain the equal variance assumption, please put up two fingers. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, please put up three fingers. Right. Here's our Levine's test for equal variance, and here's our sig value. What do we do with our sig values? Okay. So one is reject. Two is retain. Three is, I don't know what this guy's talking about. <laughs> okay. All right. Here's our sig value. Let's see what people are voting for. Okay, I've got almost everybody getting it incorrect, except I think Jenna's got the correct answer. Jenna's got it too. You want to retain? Yes. You're correct. Well, why do you want to retain? That's right, okay. Who's who following that? <laughs> okay, point four. Okay, so, okay, so here's what happens when you do a two-stepper. When you do a two-stepper, all of a sudden there are two sig values floating around. One pertains to the test for equal variances. Are they similarly width, so to speak? Okay, and then later on we'll ask a question about whether we can evaluate the null hypothesis of the t-test itself for equality of means, and then we might come to a conclusion there about retain or reject separately. But we have to come to this conclusion first and that conclusion second. Who's following that? Okay? All right. Really good. Really good. Okay? So it turns out that those variances, those standard deviations, are not identical, but they're pretty close. In fact, they're sufficiently close that Levine says, hey, you passed the equal variance assumption test. Okay? And we're, we're over here. Okay? All right. So basically they're telling us that the the variances might look more like that guy and that guy than like that one and that one. Okay, they're relatively similar. Who's seeing the similarity there in the picture? Yeah? Is that working for us? Okay. All right, now, we're not done yet. That was step one. Step two, and I think everybody's going to get this one right, now we're evaluating the null hypothesis that those means are equal. Okay? Let's go back to our finger vote. If you think you'd like to reject the null hypothesis here, please put up one finger. If you'd like to retain the null hypothesis for equal variance, uh, for uh, equality of means, excuse me. Then we'll put up two fingers. If you're not sure what's going on, we'll put up three. Okay, I'm getting lots of good feedback here. I'm seeing lots of twos. Do you want to help us out, Katie? Um, yeah, you retain the null hypothesis because the uh, sig value is equal to the greater than 0.05. Okay, the sig value is greater than 0.05 in either case. Anybody know which of these two? There are two sig values here. Which one do we use? Any idea about that? Go ahead, Jenna. Thank you. That first one, because um, if you go back to yep. that, that first box, it's equal variance to Right. Equal right. So we're almost coming to a fork in the road on this thing, right? If we come this far, and if that turns out to be significant, 
then we have to drop down to equal variance is not assumed and we'll use the bottom line. Okay? If on the other hand, uh, this turns out to be non-significant and that is a non-significant value, then we stay right along the top. Okay? So the better uh, value to report in this particular case, arguably, the better value would be the 0 0.674. I think in this case it didn't matter. You would have retained the, the null hypothesis either way. Who's following that? And then Natalie has a question. Yeah. So, what happens when they, when they oppose each other? Yeah. So, so. So. Oh, thank you. So could it be the case that this guy is oh something like um, just on one side of 0.05 and this guy is just on the other side? The deciding factor then would be can you keep that variance or not? Right, can you, did you pass this equal variance test or not? Okay? So once you're, you're getting this far, that decision is kind of already made. Okay? You're either going to be on the bottom line or the top line. Okay? Right. And there are cases when you're right at the margin where uh, depending on what you're doing with your assumption, you either reject the null hypothesis or you don't. So this is just a little bit more confusing and that we do this one a little further into the semester like we are because we needed you to get this down first that's the rule that you learn, and you'll always apply it. The new wrinkle today is we're still going to apply it like always, but we have one preliminary step. We're going to test our assumptions of this parametric test. Go ahead, Jenna. So what does it mean, assuming that this can happen, if you, if you like, uh, retain the null hypothesis for, or sorry, the equal variance assumption, yes. But like rejected the null hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah, right. So what this is telling us, and uh, maybe we can all do this with our hands. Can we all, can we all make a bell curve? Okay, let's so all make a bell curve, all right? So show me a really thin bell curve. Show me a really fat bell curve. Okay, this is how fat is your bell curve. Okay, that's all this is, right? This one is where are the bell curves left to right relative to each other? Here, the two bell curves are very, very different from each other. Now they're more similar. Now they're more similar. Now, okay, so this is all about really the means, and this is about the variances. So anybody remember that when we do descriptive statistics, we have two broad categories of descriptive statistics, what those might be? Central tendency and what was the other thing? Dispersion. This is about dispersion. This is about central tendency. A variance is relatable to a standard deviation. Right? Actually, um, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Okay? Right? Okay? So this is all about how wide is it and how variable are these scores? How dispersed are the scores for the one group and how dispersed are they for the other group? This is what are their means or what's their central tendency? This is a statistical test of their variance. This is their dispersion. This is a statistical test of their central tendency. Who's following that as a distinction? Okay. Now, we only came into that two-stepper once we had two different distributions. If we had a single sample t-test, there's only one sample. Right? So it couldn't really be different from <laughs> the variance of the other sample. There is no other sample. There's only one. Okay. All right. Great. Why don't we go ahead? Are any questions on that? That's just a stretch, Mira. Just a stretch. Okay, that's fine. Okay, really good. Okay, and, and again, you're not going to have to open SPSS, but I might ask you something about, gee, if you found a sig value that was greater than 0.05, what would you do? And if it's greater than 0.05, we're retaining. If it's less than 0.05, we're rejecting. That rule never changes. Okay. <clears throat> Why don't we go ahead and look at the very last component, and then maybe we'll save a few minutes also for questions that people might have. You can continue to chomp away on your uh, M&Ms unless you're already sick of them. <laughs> okay. Anybody want to help us out with this deal of um, two sample t-test? Oh, excuse me. Two-tailed t-test. That's what I meant to say. Two tails versus one. Which is more conservative? Two tails or one? Actually, two is more conservative. <laughs> All right, that, was, that was a good guess. All right. All right, let's see if we can understand what these things are. Two tails or one. That's the name of this section. Okay? All right. So what we can say is that we can always have a null hypothesis that looks like this. In the population, the means for the control and experimental group will be equal. And then we can just simply put in the not. They will not be equal. All right? And if we say they will not be equal, we haven't specified which one's going to be greater than which. All we're saying is that they're not equal to each other. That's all that we're saying. We've made a non-directional prediction. Who's okay with calling that non-directional? Does that mean something to all of us? Okay. Now, other times, we might make a directional prediction. If, uh, just a moment ago, Mira and Kip were leaning toward there probably is going to be a difference between men and women and how much time they spend filling out the messy. And they had an intuition that maybe the men are going to spend less time than the women would. And actually, that was true, although it wasn't statistically true. Right? But that, it was in that direction. 
They were making a directional prediction. They were saying men would spend less time than women on that particular survey. Okay? So now that might be a different looking kind of null hypothesis. Okay? In the population, the mean for the control group will be greater than the mean for the experimental group. I can tweak that here. In the population, the mean for the women will be greater than the mean for the men. Who's following that? So now we're specifying that the difference is going to be on a particular side, and it won't just be randomly on this side or that side. Please go ahead. Oh, oh you're just following that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so what we can say then is, as we've seen this many times before, we can reserve the five most extreme percentage points, two and a half up here, two and a half down there. Who's okay with that? Okay. And we don't really know where the difference is going to land. It might be over here, it might be over on that side, but it's the extreme most 5%. If we make that kind of prediction, we have a two-tailed prediction. It could be either in the lower tail or the upper tail. But what Mira and Kip were suggesting was, we think it's going to be in a very specific direction. We think that the women will spend more time, and they were making now a directional prediction. We'll still stay at 5%, that's our favorite number for this semester. But now instead of having it go left and right, we'll put all 5% on one side. Who's following that? Okay. Because we think the difference isn't just going to be randomly be either there or there with equal probability. We think the difference is going in this particular case this way. Okay. But it's still a distinction between the five most extreme and the 95 more typically occurring. It's just that we're putting all of our weight on one side and not the other. This is a one-tailed test rather than a two-tailed test. We're specifying the direction. Who's okay with that? Okay. All right. So let's see if we can make one last point about this. Some people actually prefer this. They consider this to be more conservative. Let's see if we can understand why. If I'm right here in this distribution, good little review, what is my z-score? I'm right here dead center. Wow, OK. <laughs> All right. And then I might try to go out to this 97.5 percentile. OK. And to get from the 50th percentile at 0 to the 97.5, I have to be 47.5 centiles away. Many people are following that number. Okay? I'm at 50. I need to get up to 97.5. That's a 47.5 centile chain. How about if I go with Kip and Mira's number? I start here, dead center. Now I need to get not all the way up to 97.5, but only up to 95. Okay? So I was at the 50th percentile. And I'll go up to the 95th percentile. That will leave the last five up there. So now instead of going 47.5 up, I only need to go 45 centiles up. Who's following that? Anybody lost by that? Okay. So I need actually a more extreme score back over here because I need to move 47.5 centiles away in this direction or 47.5 centiles away in that direction. Whereas over here for my one-tailed test, I don't need such a crazy extreme score. I only need 45 centiles away, but in the predicted direction. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah, right. And then when they were just saying the, like, like asking the question whether women and differ. Do they differ? Right. That would be, That'd be two tails, right? So if that would be non directional, right. Mm -hmm. And that would also require a more extreme score to reject that because we'd have to move away from the center by 47.5 centiles either that way or that way. If we only have to move a couple of centiles, that's really easy to get. If we have to move a few more, that's a little harder to get. 45 is easier to get to than 47.5. It's a shorter distance. Okay. Who's following that intuitively? Okay. All right, real good. Well, we have a couple of minutes. We've covered a lot of stuff since the last time around. Anybody have uh, something that they want to share with us? We have a, a couple of minutes to take some questions. We won't be doing any extended computation, of course. You can ask about something in today's 1015 presentation. Yeah, please go ahead. Good. Um, so if you're like looking at a z-score and you want to find the percentile rank from that z-score, do you, like I know it's the area under the bell curve. Okay. Is it like the area to the right or the area to the left of like that number? Okay, so the percentile rank, if I can, here's, this is relatively bell-shaped. I wonder if I can take advantage of that. Okay, so let's say that you're at the 95th percentile, just hypothetically, okay? So that means that you're all the way up here. So that means that uh, your score is at or above 95% of all the scores. Okay? So, so we're going from over here is 0, and then we're going to be adding it up to here's the 50th, uh, here's the 95th, and then there's 5% that way. Okay. Does that help? Yeah. So 
So we start from the far left, you can think of it that way, okay, on that bell-shaped curve, and we go cumulatively over to our right. Over here, we're at zero, all the way on the other extreme, we're at 100. Here, we'd be at 95-ish, okay? Okay. All right. I'll be around for another moment or... No, actually, we have a couple. We have one minute. It was before the group, before we let you go. <laughs> Anybody else have a question for the good of the order? Yes, please. I could, but I won't. And, and let me tell you why. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was a very good question, and I, thank you for asking. Who's ever heard the expression, feed a person a fish, you feed them for a day? Teach a person to fish, and you feed them for a lifetime, okay? So I could do that. I could actually take the test for you also on, on <laughs> okay? Right? I don't know how I do, uh, but um, so that's, that's the spirit in which that's offered. But it's a very good question, and it's a teaching moment, so thank you for asking. Oh, and there's the bell. So enjoy your M&Ms. I hope you'll come out at 4.30 tomorrow. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your M&M &M participation. We couldn't bust them. See you. Okay, see you. Thanks, Meg. See you.